It's no secret, the United States and China are smack dab in the middle of one of history's largest naval arms races. In 2020, the Chinese Navy surpassed the US in overall number of warships for the first time ever. On the other hand, the US fleet is more advanced and has far more tonnage. But US naval leadership has seen the writing on the wall and attempted to kick the military industrial complex back into high gear. So what new warships, weapons, and tactics will they acquire over the next decade? And will it be the correct ones needed to keep China in check? If we want to understand the US Navy's plan to modernize, it's worth looking at its two greatest influences. Alfred Mahan was a United States naval officer and strategist who wrote the 1890 book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. It's basically the naval bible now. In it, Mahan argued that the control of maritime trade routes were crucial for the success of a global power. He recommended maintaining naval bases and refueling logistics stations all around the world. He pointed out that control of strategic maritime choke points have had a decisive impact on the outcome of wars throughout history all the way back to 400 BC. We can easily see today how his theories were extremely influential on how the US Navy evolved. Then there was Sir Julian Corbett, who was a British naval historian and strategist who published Some Principles of Maritime Strategy in 1911. It's like the Torah of the Navy, an analogy doesn't work. Corbett was in some ways the counterpoint to Mahan. He argued for avoiding decisive battles, engaging in raids on the enemy instead. Critics of Mahan believed that he had an overemphasis on large, heavy armed battleships. They believed a smaller, more agile Navy could be more effective at sea denial and disrupting larger fleets through asymmetric means. Sir Corbett placed more emphasis on limited warfare and coordinating with other military branches, even making use of diplomacy. The naval problems facing Mahan and Corbett over a hundred years ago are many of the same ones faced today. Their works have influenced national naval policies around the world for over a hundred years now. Anytime the US Navy has to modernize, to face a new adversary, there's going to be debates about three main things. First, what is the correct number of warships we should have? Second, what is the correct type of warships we should have? And third, what is the correct mission for these warships? Before we can determine the possible answers to those questions, let us first diagnose the problem. Currently, the US Navy only has about 290 vessels compared to China's roughly 370. China is expected to hit 475 ships by 2035. Believe me, I'm almost dumb enough to make a unidimensional analysis that more ships equals better, but I'm going to resist every urge to stop there. Because we can see the US has 11 aircraft carriers and 14 ballistic missile submarines, which form the backbone of a blue water navy. Meanwhile, China has less than half in both those critical categories. When added together, the US Navy has about 4.6 million tons of displacement, or about twice the amount of tonnage as the Chinese Navy. We'll see later on that comparing a Navy's power based solely on tonnage and ship hulls doesn't give you a clear picture of their actual abilities, but yes, heavier ships typically translate to more weapon systems and capabilities per ship. But there are many other variables that are just as important for us to weigh. One consideration the US Navy has to make in terms of mission that the Chinese don't have to worry about right now is that they have a global footprint, which stretches their resources thinner. According to this article from WarOnTheRocks.com by Mackenzie Eaglin, the demand for US Naval forces outmatches the supply, because in 2015 they were reportedly only able to meet 44% of the requests made on combatant commanders around the world. Leadership claimed they needed an additional 150 extra ships just to meet those demands. Now, Mackenzie goes on to write that in 2016, Navy combatant commanders testified they would need a fleet of at least 80 attack submarines to fill all these requests. So currently, the US Navy only has about 53 attack submarines. It would take a decade or more to meet this requirement. So, we can of course argue that the Navy is essentially just trying to create the case for why they should get more funding and resources but the lack of ships is somewhat of a concern. This is where the question of mission comes into the picture. Some would ask if the Navy needs to avoid trying to answer every single humanitarian and security call that's made of them. 
Should the Navy be trying to dominate and control the seas like Mahan suggested, or should they share its responsibilities with allies and use a more diplomatic approach like Corbett suggested? I'm oversimplifying it here, of course, but I think these are useful ways of understanding the Navy's predicament. Sir Corbett reiterated Clausewitz when he said, quote, military action must still be regarded only as a manifestation of policy. It must never supersede policy. The policy is always the object, war is how we obtain the object, and the means must always keep the end in view. What this means, I think, is that our Navy's force structure should be built and designed to protect our national interest or achieve specific diplomatic goals. Currently, that goal seems to be aimed at deterring war in the Pacific. At its peak, the US Navy operated 6,700 ships at the end of World War II. In the 1980s, the US had about 550 warships, while naval planners advocated for a 600-ship navy with 15 carrier strike groups. During the 1980s, old Iowa-class battleships were recommissioned, and the Navy reached a recent height of 594 warships in 1987. However, when the Soviet Union collapsed shortly after that, it appeared there was no longer a need for such a massive peacetime navy and the force has steadily declined to 290 today. Mahan's theories about a large, decisive battle might not be relevant today, but his push for maintaining a large navy has endured. Then, in December 2016, a major turning point happened when the navy released a force structure goal that called to reverse this trend of a smaller navy. They aimed to increase the fleet to 355 ships in one version of the plan by 2042. The Congressional Budget Office found that they plan to retire more destroyers, cruisers, and submarines than they'll commission over the next 10 years. What this means is that they'll be down to 285 ships by 2026. But then, this trend would reverse after that, and the Navy would start to grow in their numbers. Part of the reason why the Navy modernization can be controversial is because of how long it takes to build warships and the enormous amount of resources, materials, and money that they cost. For example, it takes like five to six years from the time when a destroyer is ordered to when it's finally commissioned on the active duty in the fleet. That's about five times longer than it takes to build your average Abrams tank. This means naval planners need to plan far into the future, and if they're wrong, it's difficult to turn things around midway through development. The Navy periodically creates these 30-year plans to help view procurement far into the future. There was a recent report in Bloomberg, they wrote an article that called into question how corrupt the Chinese military is and claimed through some unverified anonymous sources that their missiles were filled with water. Since then, it appears that the accuracy of these claims are, are questionable at best. Now, while it's true China's rocket forces, they face corruption, but this problem is not unique to them. There's also been a major corruption scandal inside the US Navy, where one defense contractor nicknamed Fat Leonard overcharged the Navy for more than 35 million bucks. In return, he bribed scores of naval officers in the United States Navy with over $500,000 and ladies of the night so he could get favorable contracts and intel reports from them. I find it fun to take jabs at our adversaries and to make cracks about China's corruption and the inferiority of some of their weapon systems. At the same time, it would be unwise to discount their abilities or think that they're not a threat to Taiwan. U.S. naval leadership is concerned enough about the threat that they're even creating an entirely new strategy to address the issues that we've laid out so far. Because the Chinese military has explicitly built their naval forces around the concept of killing American aircraft carriers. They've invested in a network of land-based ballistic anti-ship missiles that can strike out to 3,000 kilometers. So in response, the U.S. Navy's new model calls for a more distributed approach to naval firepower with new missiles across more platforms. And the return of a ship class that the Navy hasn't really widely built since the 1980s. I'm talking about the frigate. As the Cold War ended though, the US Navy didn't see a need for a peacetime Navy to build these smaller ships. But in 2017, frigates were back on the menu. They were back in style. When the Navy announced the FFG-X program to bring back this blast from the past. The Navy needs more ships and they need them fast. So the FFGX program had an extremely short timetable. The project shopped around the world to modify an existing design instead of designing something from scratch. The project went from the FREM multi-purpose frigate 
as the base design. It's been built since 2007 by Italian company Fincantiniere and the French firm Naval Group. The Frem underwent significant modifications to become the United States Navy's Constellation class. This is America's new, next generation frigate, and they plan to manufacture about 20 of these. The Constellation FFG-62 class packs a punch. The whole point of the Navy's new distributed firepower concept is to spread offensive capabilities throughout the fleet. So the new frigates will be armed with 32 of the Mark 41 VLS missile cells for launching Tomahawk cruise missiles, enhanced Sea Sparrow missiles, or your standard series missiles. The Center for the International Maritime Security wrote this great article by Dmitry Flipyov on the new distributed warfare theory, which is now regarded as the superior chef's kiss method. It's a pretty drastic departure from essentially a millennia of historical naval battles, which were often characterized by decisive clashes between very concentrated fleets. This distributed warfare reminds me of Sir Corbett's concept about raiding tactics against enemy forces. Now, one of the main ways we try to quantify our Navy's power is by counting the number of vertical launch systems that they have across the fleet. Launch cells are kind of the cornerstone of modern naval power like how cannons were in the past. They can carry air defense or long-range strike missiles. In 2021, the Center for Military Studies published the total numbers of VLS cells in use within the US military and 14 NATO navies. This Excel sheet style breakdown right behind me here, you can see that the US Navy has the most with a total of 8,646 vertical launch cells. And this Forbes article written by David Axe estimates that the US has about 10,196 ship and submarine launch potential missiles. Under the Navy's new plan, by 2053, they claim they would have 20% more missile launch cell firepower. They wouldn't all be loaded with offensive missiles, though. You need to account for the fact that there's going to be a mix between defensive and strike capabilities, but it's a good place to start with assessing naval power. Our European allies bring a combined extra 2,328 additional missile launch cells to the table. Meanwhile, China's Navy has estimated to only have about 4,168 missile launch cells, but that estimate is from 2021, and their capabilities will be closer to 4,500 to 5,000 today. I think this metric is far more important to consider than the number of total ship hulls or tonnage. I should also point out that some missile cells are larger than others, and there's a good argument to be made that looking at any single factor like launch cells is a bit reductive. We should look at the Navy's capabilities and strategy as a whole to better appreciate the situation. In modern naval combat, firing more missiles at an enemy at the same time gives a greater chance of overwhelming an enemy's defenses and scoring a hit. So the more missiles carried by the fleet, the better. One of the current limitations of this missile launch weapon system is that they need to retreat all the way back to shore, then it has to be tied down, so that the ship is completely immobile, then special missile reloading cranes are brought in to reload each missile safely. The whole process can take a ship out of the fight for weeks. The Navy is experimenting with rearm at sea capabilities, getting it to work with dummy ammo at the pier, but not in open sea, which would be more difficult. One solution to pump up those launch cell numbers is by adding modular Mark 40 container launchers. You basically slap them onto any deck of a ship to increase their missile firepower. So the Constellation class is going with tried and tested technologies instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. This is because naval procurement has gotten itself into hot water trying to adopt leap ahead technologies that promised ambitious, huge new abilities, but arguably fell short like the zoom wall and the littoral combat ship. More ships means more nodes for watching the seas and skies, which is another advantage to the distributed model that the Navy's going for now. The first ship in this new Constellation class is projected to roll out in 2026 and cost about $1.28 billion, but as production continues, this cost is expected to drop down to $900 million. That may sound like a lot, but it's a real steal compared to the like $2.2 billion price tag of an Arleigh Burke destroyer. 
I try to keep in mind that comparing cost of vessels, it's a hotly debated issue, so I take all of that with a grain of salt. The other dimension to increasing firepower throughout the fleet is the introduction of the Naval Strike Missile. The NSM replaces the older Harpoon missile that had been the standard US and NATO anti-ship missiles since like 1977. Compared to the Harpoon's radar guidance, the NSM's combination of GPS and infrared guidance systems are entirely passive. So what that means is that targets get much less warning that the missile's heading their way. The Naval Strike Missile doesn't fly supersonic, but it is extremely agile. It's able to make turns and climb and dive on targets in an unpredictable pattern that's really hard to intercept with defensive gunfire or missiles. The Constellation class frigates will have 16 Naval Strike Missiles each, giving the nimble frigates excellent over-the-horizon striking capability. For longer-ranged engagements, the US is currently testing the conventional prompt strike hypersonic missile on the Zumwalt destroyers and the Virginia-class submarines. We do know that one test firing reached a target 3,700 kilometers away in under 30 minutes, really earning that prompt part of the name. Even with today's current less than ideal force structure, according to the best unclassified research document available about how a Taiwan invasion scenario would actually go down, a 2022 war game conducted by the Center for International and Strategic Studies predicted that proper use of American submarines could sink up to 90% of China's invasion fleet. The problem is dealing with the combat losses though. Even in the most optimistic war game results, the US still lost about a quarter of its submarine fleet and over 2,000 sailors. This is why the US military is so focused on deterring a war from ever happening in the first place. But none of this confronts the underlying problem that America's shipbuilding is lagging behind the Chinese. This is a lot more complex of a problem than most people realize. The limiting factor for US shipbuilding isn't actually a lack of shipyard space, heavy machinery, or material resources. It's skilled labor there's a major labor shortage affecting both public and private shipyards that service the US Navy and no one's talking about it. American manufacturing jobs in general have been on the decline for decades and it's hit the maritime sector especially hard. This leads to an aging workforce that can't replace skilled craftsmen with trained new talent fast enough. To explain this a little more in depth, I wanna introduce you to our researcher and writer, Diego Acetuno. The Navy has four public shipyards, but these are all short staffed by about 1,000 shipbuilders, and private shipyards are also struggling to meet personnel demands. Apprenticeship programs help, like how Huntington Ingalls, which is one of the largest shipbuilders in the country, is having their 1,200 master shipbuilders impart their 40 years of experience to younger apprentices and journeymen, but no national apprenticeship standards exist for shipbuilding, and each company does their work differently. Shipbuilding is a complicated industry that can't be automated anywhere near as much as you might think. So it takes actual experienced hands to build combat ready ships that won't fall apart during wartime or rough seas. But this tiny workforce has to split their duties between building new ships along with maintenance of existing ships, upgrade projects and decommissioning retired vessels. You'd think retiring a vessel would be as simple as recycling it, but it's a long, carefully planned process. And dividing a small workforce causes major delays, cost overruns, and accidents. During fiscal year 2022, only 36% of ship contracts were finished on time. And that's down from 44% the previous year. And where is production happening? At its peak, there were 14 shipbuilding locations in America. Today, there are just seven. These seven shipyards are owned by only four prime contractors. For comparison, China currently has 20 shipyards supporting their military modernization efforts. But in 2018, the Navy launched a $21 billion initiative to modernize and improve the four major public shipyards in the country. The U.S. has also started packaging production contracts with workforce development funding to help kickstart the job market and train a new generation of skilled shipbuilders. As for actual building of ships, the Navy has presented three alternative approaches to Congress to expand the size of the battle force by 2045, for roughly similar price tags. The first approach aims to maximize more large, next-generation surface combatants like the upcoming DDG-X, along with small amphibious ships to support coastal operations. Alternative number two goes the undersea route, building more current-generation submarines along with larger amphibious ships. Alternative three expands the size of the fleet the fastest, adding 75 ships by 2045, 
but obviously requires the most investment of funds, about $32 billion per year. And that's only if the contracts can stay on time and on budget. But there's another angle that the Navy is betting will make up the gap and corner the market on the next big thing, which is unmanned platforms. These futuristic drones and uncrewed vessels are already making a splash as they're introduced into the Western Pacific, and the Department of the Navy plans to have a large and diverse inventory of naval drones within 10 years. In fact, the Navy hopes to have as many as 150 unmanned vessels, augmenting its battle fleet by 2045. I'd love to know what Mahan and Corbett would think of unmanned ships and how that would fit into their analysis. The US Navy faces deep systemic challenges that range from fighting against corruption to trying to convince policymakers that investing more in the future of the Navy is a priority. This has made it difficult to keep up with the raw production numbers of the PRC, but as we've seen, an increase in the firepower, tactics, and alliances can offset that disadvantage. While the Navy and the US government as a whole deserve some criticism for not taking action sooner, if there's one thing the US Navy has always proven, it's that other nations underestimate it at their own risk. So what do you think? Will the US Navy be prepared to take on China? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Follow me on Instagram at CappyArmy for updates, and I'll see you all again in the next report.